I'm hitting record on the computer, so everybody should be able to, I, I should not have to redo this again. <laughs> Though I have found that the more I redo something, the better it is the second time. So maybe if I did this three or four times, then I'd have it down pat perfectly, right? But anyway, <coughs> I want to thank all of you for taking this class with me. This is about the third time I have taught the class of Exodus. And uh, every time I'm, I'm adding more to my arsenal, I'm learning a lot more. I'm uh, being challenged a lot more. And I hope that this class has been a great challenge to you. Uh, we're supposed to meet this week as well as next week. And then the last week is going to be next week. But I think in lieu of meeting next week, I'll just send out the uh, final. I haven't got it done yet. I'll just send out the final. And whenever y'all get all that done, maybe take next Thursday night and do the final. And uh, then we will be done, okay? And uh, I'll try to get the grades to you as quickly as I possibly can. I'm still working on the stuff from the last semester on Christian ethics and all. So um, one day I'm going to sit down and do nothing but grade, 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 and, and get all this stuff done, along with trying to be an elder and trying to get us back into the church at uh, South Cobb and trying to get in the building and, and everything else. Life has been just great. And I'm not going, I don't want anybody to think I'm complaining because I am not. I'm just rejoicing that I'm able to do what I can to, to bless, uh, hopefully bless the Lord and, and hopefully help you guys out. Uh, a couple of other things. As I said, this class may be even a little bit shorter than it usually has been. And it's supposed to be a two and a half hour class. But the majority of what we're talking about tonight is mainly going to be on them actually building the tabernacle. You remember the, and we talked about this the last week or so, is the idea that there's so much in here in Exodus about the preparations and the uh, outline and the um, way that the tabernacle was supposed to be built. And then as we studied last week, from chapter 32 through chapter 34, there was a break because the children of Israel had actually been guilty of breaking the first and second commandment. And so Moses had to deal with that issue. And then what we read last week, and this is one of the things I really enjoyed looking at, was God's self-revelation of himself in Exodus 34, 6, and 7. And we also see that God reinstituted the covenant. Even though they had broke the covenant, he reinstituted the covenant. And every time I read this story, a lot of times we have the idea, and we hear a lot of people that, do suggest the idea that the God of the Old Testament is very, very different from the God of the New Testament. He's not. He had the right to destroy the children of Israel right there when they sinned, did he not? But he didn't. He could have made a whole other nation. It may have taken longer, but with God, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So God wants us to understand, even in the Old Testament, the kind of God that he is. And we spend a lot of time talking about that. So in the last part of this, as we're talking about it tonight, I'm not going to go into all the details about all of this, but again, he's mainly going to be talking about three, three things I'm going to try to stress tonight. Him actually getting the um, gold and silver and everything else they need to build this tabernacle and how the people's heart was ready for, them to, for that to happen. Secondly, we're going to talk about the idea of what happened whenever they did get the tabernacle built. And we're going to talk, and, and that's where I'm hoping to spend a little bit more time tonight talking about this kind of as a closing, is God dwelling with them. And what does that look like then? And what does that look like today? And I hope and pray that as we're studying this together, we can hopefully realize, and I think it's a very important thing, and, and it's, it's something that would encourage us right now as we go through this, whole pandemic situation and the fact of how is God with us now? And I think it would help maybe help our attitude and our understanding of what, what, who God is, but also to understand we're not left alone in all of this. And I'm grateful for that. And so I'm, that's what my plan is for the rest of the evening tonight. Before I go any further though, two things. Do you have any questions or comments about anything we've studied thus far that you want to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no, and uh, we are adding some more folks added to this just a little bit here. So, uh, hey, brother Tim, well, 
Hey, brother, how you doing? Good to see you. <clears throat> Tonight we'll be in the last class. Next week, I'm just going to go ahead and let y'all work on the uh, uh, final exams, and uh, we'll go from there, okay? So that's what that's going to be about next week. Um, <clears throat> As I said, I'm going to talk tonight about very briefly about the actual building of the tabernacle. I want to start off tonight in Exodus chapter 30, uh, 35, Exodus chapter 35, <clears throat> and I'm going to hit some highlights as we go through here a little bit further. Before we go any further, let's pray. I'm grateful, Father, for this day, and I'm grateful for those that have come and that are part of this class. I am grateful, Lord, for every one of them and the way they've encouraged me. And I pray, Father, that we might have grown closer to you and closer to one another because of, of this study that we had. Father, we know that you're the same God from the beginning to the end. You're not a different kind of God in the Old Testament. You're the same God that you are in the New that you do not want to destroy people. You do not want to punish people for their sins, but being a just God, you have to. And Father, it, it amazes us that you sent your only begotten son to die to where we can live. And we're grateful for that. And Father, I'm grateful for the Old Testament that helps us to understand you as you are. And I pray, Father, that we would always remember that you've never changed that we will always strive to avail ourselves of the mercy and the grace you give us, that you would prick our hearts whenever we start going away that is not in accordance with your word, that we might do all that we can to have the kind of heart that you have. Amen. To help others to know the gospel. To help yes. others, Lord, to know what they need to be doing. And Lord, helping us to have the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness for those yes. that might offend or upset us. Holy Father, we are so grateful for you. And we look so forward to getting home to be with you in heaven. We don't know when that's going to be, but Lord, until that time, help us to be faithful. Yes. We ask these things for every one of my students and for me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, I'm grateful to you so much. We're going to, as I said, we're going to hit some highlights as we actually start seeing them build the tabernacle. You begin realizing in Exodus chapter 35, he starts off this whole section here with reminding them about the Sabbath day regulations. And again, we've talked about the Sabbath day and how this was a very important part of the Ten Commandment law, but it's extremely interesting as you're actually seeing them build the tabernacle, God reminds them concerning this. And it's something I never thought of before, but as I was studying this again today. Um, you know, a lot of times when we get into a building project, I don't care what it is, but when we get into a building project, a lot of times we work around the clock to get that building built as quickly as we can. And if you're part of it, and especially nowadays, it seems like Sundays used to be somewhat of a day of rest, and I've shared that with you before. But nowadays, people are working, you know, seven days a week, just trying to make ends meet and trying to do what they need to be doing. And again, we, we need to be in prayer for all those that are <clears throat> affected by this coronavirus and how many of them lost their job and try to do what we can to help them. But isn't it interesting that as God brings them back to the, to the relationship that he had with them to begin with, isn't it interesting he reminds them of this Sabbath day regulation? And so that helped me to remind myself of the fact that whenever they started building this tabernacle, they take every seven days off. They take every Sabbath day off. They did not work through until they got it built. They would take every seventh day off. And it says something again, goes back to what I shared with you before in the idea that we do need to take time off, that we do need to take some time to rejuvenate our spirits, to connect with God, to be what we need to be. And again, he makes it very, very clear that Sabbath regulation starts off chapter 35, one through three. He says, you shall not do any work on the Sabbath day, because if you do, that person shall be put to death. And uh, we're going to read as you're going through Leviticus and Numbers, especially that there is going to be a man that's picking up sticks and he is put to death. The idea of being cut off suggests that idea. So again, it just kind of reminds us that even through all of this, as important as the tabernacle was, 
in bringing man and God in a relationship together close, they, they still had to follow and obey these commands. We go on a little further <clears throat> as it goes on down through there. He talks about the idea, and I've got this underlined in my Bible in verse five, take from among you an offering to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart. And I kind of referenced that earlier when we talked about the idea of the plan for the tabernacle. Now God is just reiterating this and saying, whoever has the right heart, let them bring it as an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze. And we get down again, looking at all the stuff that got brought, bought or brought to this in this respect. But I just want to key in on the idea again of the willing heart. In the New Testament, he emphasizes the idea that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, when he talks about that idea of giving, that he, God wants a willing heart more than anything else. If we give God stuff grudgingly, uh, he, he's, he's not going to accept it. You could give him a billion dollars, but if you were grudging giving it to him, he won't accept it. And so that, that's something that should just remind us that when it comes to all parts and all aspects of our worship to God, <clears throat> in our relationship to God, <clears throat> we've got to have our hearts right. We've got to have our hearts right. And so again, he stresses that ideal. And then it's like, again, he's trying to emphasize this again. Here's what I read and going on in verse 20. <clears throat> All the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Then everyone who came whose heart was stirred. The words there in the Hebrew means whose heart lifted him up. And everyone whose spirit was willing, and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting for all its service and for the holy garments. And then he starts listing all the things that they did. And so here you have again in chapter 35, verse 21, whoever heart was stirred, they started bringing this, and they're bringing all this gold and all that's involved in, in, in doing that, the bronze, the silver, everything else, they, they start bringing that. Notice verse 30 and 31, he has given Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. God, verse 31, has filled him with the Spirit of God. Now here, <coughs> we'll talk about it in just a few minutes more, but here we have one of the first references in the Old Testament about the Spirit. You remember the very first reference we read about the Spirit of God is found in Genesis chapter 1, and the Spirit of God was hovering or or over the um, face of the water. So here you have God's spirit actually being referenced again. And hopefully if we continue to go through this study tonight, we'll talk a little bit more about that idea of how God dwells with us today. All right. So here the spirit of God, God filled him or filled Bezalel with, this, uh, with the spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. So Bazalel becomes the <clears throat> head contractor or head uh, foreman, if you want to put it, if, if we were trying to understand it today, over everything that's going on. And so think about the, how big and how massive this job would have been. You would have needed to have goldsmiths. You would have needed to have silversmiths. You would have needed to have people that works in bronze. You would have had people that worked in wood. You would have had to have people that worked in um, uh, weaving cloth, heavy cloth, uh, weaving these goat skins together and, and everything along this line. So there probably were a lot of people involved. I don't know, we don't even have a good estimate about how many people, but could it be that not only did these people give, but if they actually uh, were able to do some of this, then they would have had even that much more to do to make sure that this tabernacle was built. And again, God stressed this idea of a willing heart because if they were not willing, none of this could have been done. So again, how often today is that, that, that same idea brought out in the Lord's church? There's a lot of people that come and sit to church and, and they give, but a lot of times they give grudgingly. And then whenever you and really ask them to give something like time and effort to a particular work that the church is going on, then, well, that's what we pay the preacher for. That's what we pay somebody else to do. And you just go ahead and get it done for us. And we'll, uh, you know, we, 
we'll just sit back and pay it, right? Um, I don't know the sizes of your congregations that you're a part of, and, and I, I'm not trying to meddle or anything like that, but, but what is awful and interesting is the fact that we build huge buildings or we build buildings to worship together. There's always upkeep on a building. Um, and that's where we need to get the people involved. I mean, you know, if you got a painter, get them to paint. You got a plumber, help him get the plumbing done, you know, because there's always going to be things to do in that respect. Let's not belittle that work, okay? Because working in a building and trying to make sure everything is where it needs to be for brethren to gather together to worship on Sundays and Wednesdays, that's very important. But let us at the same time, let's not go to the extent of saying, that all the work that we do as a church is done in the building. Sometimes I think we place more emphasis on the building than we do on the people. And let me say this, and this is part of the reason why I got into the Georgia School of Preaching and, and able to teach and, and what I do, what I do. To me, the most important building we will do is building people. Helping people to grow to the point to where they can teach a Bible class. They can teach a Bible study. They can talk to their friends and neighbors about and, and uh, loved ones about Jesus. They can share the gospel just as well as any of us. You know, I'm not a very extroverted person. I'm kind of an introverted person. So I, I'm, <clears throat> it, it's really putting me out of my comfort zone to, to just walk up to somebody and talk to them about the Lord. I've got to break some ice first. You know what I'm saying? That's my uh, thing that I need to work on a little bit more. But different people have different talents. And again, we have a responsibility, and especially as leaders and those of us that are going through these classes, it's a challenge for all of us to do what we can to encourage everybody that we can to get more involved in this. As we're going to see, whenever they, they start giving, they start giving so much that Bazal will actually say, look, we need to stop. We need to stop contributions. We've gotten more than enough as it is right now. You know, I have never been in a church where we've had more than enough contributions. <laughs> you know, it seems like sometimes we're just, we're making ends meet, but then at the same time, it also depends on where we're spending our money. We've got a very big budget at South Cobb on mission work. and We're supporting about six or seven different missions. And uh, we've talked about trying to support a mission full time just by ourselves. And uh, so start thinking about the kind of money that would be involved in that. But, but whatever we could do, we need to find ways to get people involved. Because when people are involved, then <clears throat> they will be more committed and they will be more of what God wants and what God expects of them to be. God never, ever, 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 told us that the extent of our Christian walk is sitting in the pew, okay? He never, ever told us that. And in fact, if, if that's the attitude anybody has, we need to help people understand that's not the work of the church. Sitting in the pew for worship on Sunday is not the work of the church. The work of the church means all of us getting involved and doing what we need to do. So, as I said, I could spend a, a little bit more than time in that respect <clears throat> and talk about it. But notice, whenever a person has their heart right, you're not going to have a problem with them doing the work, whatever it might be, when their heart's what it needs to be. So, again, one of the biggest challenges that the church has is not just getting the people involved but getting them to have the buy-in that comes from a heart that loves the Lord. And again, I think another thing that may have encouraged them here in Exodus to give as they did was the fact that God had spared them from being destroyed after the sin with the golden calf. God's grace motivates Christian, godly living. When we understand that we could be punished, but we understand how God has lovingly forgiven us because of our sins, 
that's the motive that causes us to love him that much more and saying, Oh Lord, what can I do? As Isaiah would say, here am I, send me Lord, you know, put me to work. So I think that's a very big challenge that we've got to do. Now, as you go on to look, continue to look at the story, as you see these guys beginning to work at this, notice again, and what I was trying to do, and I'm going through here, is we're looking in Exodus 35, verse 21, every man whose heart was willing or stirred and his spirit was willing, they brought the Lord's offering. Go down to chapter 35, verse 31. He says, God has filled him, Bezalel, with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and all manner of workmanship, verse 34, and put in his heart the ability to teach. So you see, not only was Bezalel uh, the main guy in charge, but he's also teaching others <coughs> how to do what needs to be done. How important is it that, and isn't it interesting that the work of the church today has to be a work of teaching, right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15, 16. Uh, Matthew says that you go <coughs> into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16. And Matthew says, he's talking to his disciples here. He says, you go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are to go what? Teach all nations. What's the difference between preaching and teaching? What's the difference between preaching and teaching? Um, I, I would think that preaching, unless you were teaching for us, teaching I, I see as a dialogue, uh, a, a, a transaction between two persons. Okay. Where you are trying to train the person's mind, but that is through discussion and through dialogue and through hands on and whatever. It's an interaction thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas, in terms of me preaching, is one dimensional. It is you sit and listen. Um, whereas in teaching, you are asking the person to exchange ideas with you with the hope of leading them to a particular point as you do in preaching, but there's no one dimension. It's not one dimensional. All right. And that says a lot about that. And I think that's a very good definition of what you said. But isn't it interesting that sometimes today we have preachers that do not teach the gospel individually. Uh, right. they, they do, and, and don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. God bless them with the ability to speak publicly and to sway people's hearts, right? Then you have uh, uh, what we might, like you said earlier, a teacher that might be very, very, very good at soul winning, but may not be that very, uh, very and may not be able to preach at all. Which one is more important? Neither. <laughs> Both are important. <laughs> I feel that I feel that both of them, it's, it's important. If a preacher pushing you, who hasn't taught you, he hasn't done his job. Right, right. And so, and again, think about this: for the preacher and the teacher, and should be for every member of the church. It has to start in the heart. It has to start in our hearts. Our heart has to be right with God. And so here you have Bazalel. God has put in his heart the ability to teach, and he has filled them with skill to do all manner of work and engraver and the designer, etc. So we go on to the 36th chapter. He says, Bazalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan, they're going to be doing the work, and they call them, verse 2, Moses called Bazalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart were stirred, to come and do the work. And I'm just challenging you to look here in verse chapter 35, verse 21, and verse 31, and then in chapter 36, verse 2, the importance of the heart. So when we start thinking about how to build the church and what we need to do to build the church, there has to be preaching and teaching. But the only way there's going to be preaching and teaching is there has to be people with the heart to do it. It, it, it says something to me whenever we have to beg people to teach. Why do we do that? Now, 
we also understand from first Corinthians chapter 12, and you got to remember that this is the context of miraculous gifts of the first century that he would give some to be teachers. All right. But should it not be the case that every one of us as Christians may work on trying to be a better teacher, a better person that might be able to share the gospel with somebody either in a public way or in a private way? Should we not all become better teachers? And that necessarily means that we've got to know the stuff, but where does it really start? It starts in our hearts. Are we bothered by the lost? Does it, does it keep us awake at night? Do you, uh, if you're a leader in the church, does it bother you about the erring brother or sister in Christ? You see, it's got to start in the heart. As they're building this work, now, one of the things I, of the tabernacle, one of the things I often see is that whenever you start building a brand new church building or building on a wing to a church building or something like that, folks get excited. Why? Why? It's something new. And also, they think by increasing the building, it's mm. going to bring more people. Okay. By enlarging the building. But you got to okay. go out and get the people. Right. And sometimes we, we have the attitude of uh, field of dreams, build it, and they will come, right? And, and the thing is mm. with that is I think we like to build buildings because it actually we actually can see the results of whenever you're putting together the two befores and the sheetrock and the bricks and the windows, you can see the actual results. You can see the work being done, right? The harder thing to do is to build the church spiritually because sadly, but maybe not so sadly, we can't see the results of those efforts quite as quickly, right? You don't a lot of times see people's changed hearts as, as quickly as you want to. And so the reality is, is that it's easier to build a building with bricks and stones. It's harder to build a church, remembering that the church is not a building in the fact of it being bricks and stones, Though Paul does use that idea in, in the New Testament that the church is a building suggested that we build upon the foundation of Christ, but it's harder to build a church. It's harder to build people because people sometimes um, are hard to deal with. Amen. So I challenge us to think Amen. About it. And thank you. <laughs> I, I thank you for that. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. All righty. I want you to go on down through, as I said, well, that's chapter 36. To me, those things really jumped out to me about the idea of the heart. You again start going through this, the marking of the, the making of the Ark of the Covenant or the Mark of the uh, Ark of the Testimony, the gold lampstand, the um, altar of incense, the bronze laver, uh, the making of the garments all the materials in the sanctuary. If you have bought the commentary on um, Exodus by Brother um, <clears throat> um, Coy Roper, he gives a rough estimate of how many thousands of pounds of gold, et cetera, was uh, involved here. Um, I thought I had it marked here for just a second, but let me see if I can emphasize if I can find that page here. Um, mm, I might take a break here in a minute, try to find it and come back to it in a little bit. Ah, here it is. All right. Here is one on page. If you're looking on um, Coy Roper's commentary, here's the idea. All right. He, he says it takes 300 shekels to make one talent and a talent is 75 pounds. So 300 shekels, you divide 75 pounds by 300, and that's how much a shekel weighs. So the amount 
of the material listed in today's measures are as follows. They had over 2,193 and a quarter pounds of gold. 2,000 pounds of gold. Now, I'm not for certain. Uh, I haven't checked it, but gold may be up now because of the economy and the way things are going. It could be going up to, last time I checked it, it was $1,200 an ounce. How many ounces make a pound? 16. So if you start doing the math just a little bit, um, for 2,193 pounds of gold, multiply it by 16, and then multiply that by whatever gold's going forth now, you'll find out that this thing was expensive by today's standards. According to him, he had 7,544 and 3.38 pounds of silver. So you do the same thing with the silver, okay? And then they had 5,310 pounds of bronze. So, and he brought this point out, the total weight just in the metals the Israelites carried out of Egypt was probably about 15,000 pounds. So you're looking at, it seems like that's pretty heavy, 15,000 pounds of metal, but you've also got to remember, we're talking two and a half, three million people, the men carrying it out, so that might equal to about um, maybe a quarter of a pound for every adult male Israelite to carry with him. And think about also as well how heavy that Ark of the Covenant would have been. How heavy the, all of these other things would have been as they're carrying it around. So that's a challenge to think about in that respect. It's, it was expensive, right? How often do we always ask the question, it costs. What does it cost? Think about the idea that they willingly gave because as far as they were concerned, they were willing to give all of this up because they had that willing heart. And then think about the, everything, the idea that for us today, what does it cost? Well, it costs for our salvation, Jesus paid it all, right? How many of us have, have, how many of us have sang that song, Jesus paid it all, right? But at the same time, when we understand this, it costs us everything. Whoever loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves wife or, or child more than me is not one of me. You, you see what I'm trying to say? It's going to cost us everything. So it's something to challenge us and to think about in that respect. We think about the idea that, again, some of the people had sinned, and, and again, they had come back. God had brought them back into that relationship. I want to come now to the last part, and this is where I'm going to spend the rest of the time this evening. In Exodus chapter 40, go down to verse 34. Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. And you're saying, huh, Tommy, you're only five verses away from the end of the book. Yeah. But let's look and see what happens in these five verses. Is everybody there? Exodus 40. All right, yeah, Exodus 40, verse 34, beginning. All righty. He said, the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not take journey till the day until it was taken up. Then the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over to them by night and the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. All righty. So the book of Exodus closes with this idea of God coming down in this cloud and resting upon the tabernacle to show his people that he was there. Now, when you think about this for just a moment, you have to realize that this represented the glory of God. Notice, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So when we think about God's glory for just a few moments, we have to realize that, and this is part of the reason why I think you see the first two commandments. Uh, you shall have no other God before me. You shall not make unto thee any graven image. God makes it says this. He said, remember back in Exodus 33, verse 20, he was talking to Moses. He says, no man can see my face for humans cannot see me and live. 
And so the thing he's trying to bring out here is the direct side of God is dangerous because he is such a holy God. And we spent some time talking about that. So how did God show himself on Mount Sinai? He descended with smoke and thunder and lightnings. Remember that? So all the people saw that at that particular time. Then you think about this, this fire here. He says, Moses was not able to enter it because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So this cloud represents God being among the children of Israel in that respect. So here you have this, by the way, the first mention where he really starts talking about this bright light, this fire, the first time we read about this in the book was where? Remember Exodus 3 and 4, when God showed himself to Abraham? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Moses? Burning bush. And again, it was the burning bush, and it looked like fire, but was it really fire? I think it was some sort of a manifestation. How could the bush, if it was on fire, not burn? It was a manifestation of God. It was the glory of God. but the best way that, that Moses could explain it would be this fire here, this glory of the Lord. So again, in Exodus 24, verse 16, whenever God has given the Ten Commandments and then these elders of the people and the priests actually go up there and have this covenant meal with God. Remember, we talked about that in Exodus 24. Here again, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. In Exodus 16, <clears throat> when Moses spoke, or Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. So it's interesting that as you look in all of these examples through there, and by the way, I'm gonna give you a list of all the examples of God appearing in Exodus. Beyond, in Exodus, uh, beginning after the Passover, okay, or after the uh, Passover and after the deliverance from Egypt. Uh, and I'm going to read through them very quickly, all righty? Exodus 13, 21 and 22. And Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. <clears throat> To go by day and night, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by the night from before the people. Exodus 14, 19 and 20. The angel of the Lord, when he went up before, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from before their faces, stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, and it was cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by these night to these, so that no one came near the other all the night. Exodus 14, 24. Exodus 14, 24. In the morning watch, God, Yahweh, looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire in the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. In Exodus 16, verse 7. And in the morning you will see the glory of God. Obviously, in every one of these situations where he talks about the glory of God, it was some manifestation that they could see, right? And that's something that I just challenge you to think about as we're going to go on and talk about this a little further. So just kind of keep that in your mind. We're going to come back and visit that. Exodus 16, 9 and 10. Exodus 16, 9 and 10. Say to the whole Israelite community, or come near to Yahweh because he's heard your complaints. And they turned to look toward the desert, and just then the glory of Yahweh appeared in the cloud. Exodus 16, 33 and 34. Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put one omer of manna in it <clears throat> and then set it in Yahweh's presence where it should be kept safe for future generations. <clears throat> and Aaron did as Yahweh commanded Moses and he put it in front of the testimony for safekeeping. Um, in Exodus 17, God says, I'll be standing there in front of you in the rock on the rock of Horeb. 
Exodus 18, Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat the uh, meal with Moses' father-in-law in God's presence. Exodus 19, behold, the, verse 9, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud. The people may hear when I speak with you, and they may believe you forever. Exodus 19, on the morning of the third day, there were thunders, lightnings, and a thick cloud on the mountain. Do you hear, you keep hearing this idea of a cloud and so forth? And again, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because Yahweh had descended on it in a fire. The smoke of it went up like a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And then Exodus 20, 21, it says the people were afar off, or stood afar off, and Moses drew near under the thick darkness. So at night, this cloud was somewhat like a pillar of fire. And it gave the, the light to the people at that time, whenever they needed it. It was also a cloud during the day. It was a cloud that caused people not to be able to see God, the actual face of God, or actually come to God's presence. <clears throat> and then he emphasizes this idea. He says it calls in a thick darkness. <coughs> uh, Exodus 23, 20 through 22. I'm about to send an angel in front of you to guard you on your way. Pay attention to him. Don't rebel against him. He won't forgive you the things which you do wrong because my name is in him. But if you listen carefully to what he says and do what I say, then I'll be an enemy to your enemies and fight those who are fighting you. All right? When Moses goes up, Exodus 24, Moses and Aaron, uh, Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders went up and they saw Israel's God. Under God's feet, there was what looked like the floor of lapis lazuli tiles, dazzling pure like the sky. God didn't harm the Israelite leaders, though they looked at God and they ate and drank. Now, again, you look at that, not seeing God face to face, but they saw his image. They saw his form. We talked about that. Again, uh, when they offered the burnt offerings in Exodus 29, he says, uh, there I'll meet with the people of Israel and it shall be sanctified for my glory. I will dwell among the people of Israel. I will be their God. And they shall know that I am Jehovah, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Jehovah, their God. And so all the way through here, Exodus 32, Exodus 33, Exodus 33, 1 through 3, Exodus 33, 7 through 11, Exodus 33, 12 through 16, again, Exodus 33, 17 through 23. Uh, do you keep hearing these ideas of how God manifests himself? Chapter 34, verses 5 through 9. Uh, chapter 40, verse 34 through 38, where we are now. Numbers chapter 9, verse 15 through 23, where, again, it gives us a little more detail of when the clouds stood up and when they left. Numbers chapter 10, verses 11 through 13. Um, numbers 10, verse 34. And numbers 11, 25. And Numbers 12, 5. Numbers 12, 8. Numbers 14, 14. Numbers 16, 42. I think you get the point out of all of these passages where this cloud was with them. That cloud represented God's presence among his people. Now, how important is that to the, how important was that for them to understand this in Exodus? <clears throat> giving myself about a five minute break to be able to get my throat up. Okay. How important was, how important was it for the people in Exodus to see God's presence or to see that physical manifestation of God? You know, Tommy, what always amazes me is the number of times, like you say, that the presence of God is always with them. And yet the number of times they fail him. Right, And I think it's encouraging to us to know that, you know, there, there's a number of times, even though God is always in our presence, we are his children, but how many times do we fail him today? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's just amazing to me. They, they had, they had all these visions and all these, you know, 
first, all this firsthand knowledge and, and still, you know, didn't always get it right. Right. And um, somewhat encouraging. Can I say something? In that what? In that we don't do the same thing. And we're going to talk even lower, a little bit more about it here in a few moments about the presence of God. Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just saying, well, the, the, the presence of the Lord with us should, but it does not necessarily in our lives bring about our obedience. Right. And that's what, and that's what you see with them. And, mm -hmm. and the idea is that the, the presence of the Lord was, to, was meant to be something for them to strengthen them, to, to encourage them. But they didn't, they went the, the opposite direction. And I think, you know, as Jim said, we need to be careful that we have come into greater privileges than they have come. But mm -hmm. yet sometimes we, 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 we go astray from God. That's so we're right. no different sometimes. That's right. That's right. The tabernacle represented the presence of God. Whenever Israel sinned with the golden calf, God threatened not to go with them. And Moses said, if you don't go with us, what? Leave us right here. Remember that? And you, you've got to appreciate Moses there in that respect because he's reminding them and us the idea that we can't go anywhere without God, can we? But again, I think what I'm trying to get across, and I think all of us understand this, how often do we think God is with us? How often do we think, you know, um, I've met Christians who sin and they said, I, I feel God's presence leaving me. Um, and a lot of times, especially in the religious world today, in a, um, in a spirit more of um, that hanker or that, helps us to understand it may be more of Pentecostalism where we judge whether or not we're right in the sight of God by the emotions and all that we're feeling. How can we know that God is there? And we're going to continue to talk about that. That's kind of what I'm trying to get us to. The reason why they knew it was because they saw the cloud and they saw the fire and they saw the darkness and they saw every one of these things. And and again, to me, it goes back to the whole idea that the old covenant was part of a thing that was more based on sight than it was faith, right? Think about it. They saw these things. When you actually saw the tabernacle and remember that God was the one who said that, that would have represented that in their mind. Would they have been guilty of worshiping the Ark of the Covenant? You know, I could see that happening in some situations where the ark was just what? It was really God's footstool, right? Here on this earth. So the thing that I'm challenging us to think about the fact, think about how important it was for God to be with his people. Um, in Psalms 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. Why is it, think about this for a moment, and I'm just challenging us to step out for a moment and think about this, but how many Christians do you know are really joyous? Some of them always look like they just got finished drink, or drinking a gallon of vinegar before they come to church, right? They're sour, they're bitter, they're upset about a lot of things, and, and you got to ask the question, what's going on there? But notice he said, in your presence is fullness of joy. In Psalms 51 verse 11, the thing that David did not want to have happened after he committed the sin with Bathsheba, cast me not away from your presence. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Okay? In Psalms 95, verse 2, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Right? Um, Psalms 140, verse 13, the upright will dwell in your presence. So, think about this idea of God with us and God there, and think about it in the respect of how he manifest himself today hey tommy okay go ahead you know the israelites here are living what we're taught from hebrews 13 5 when the hebrew writer says that you know he reminds us that god says he'll he will never leave us or forsake us right. they are they are living it firsthand we're living it through faith but they're living it firsthand and i think it's a, i think it's a great lesson for us okay 
And what would be the great lesson other than, you know, than just making that point there? What would be the lesson? Well, the, the fact that, you know, you mentioned some Christians who always act like they're, you know, the world's such a, such a bother and such a problem. If, if God's for you, no one can be, you know, it doesn't matter who's against you. It doesn't matter what the world thinks of you if God's for you. And that's one of the things that I, I don't know that some Christians take to take to heart sometimes, or, or if they do, they just sort of think about it and sort of gloss it over like it's no big deal. But when I think, of, when I think what the Hebrew writer says, it's really an interesting, you know, thought of what, what we've been studying here. And, and, you know, he's been with them for, for days and weeks now. And, you know, he's going to be with them for a long time to come because like you said, when you get to the end of Exodus chapter 40 and, you know, verse 38, it says, you know, uh, the fire was over by night in the side of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. I mean, they're this, you know, he's, he's not left them yet and he's not about to leave them anytime soon. So I think it's a great lesson for us. It is. It is. I guess the point I'm trying to make is how, how can we know we saw it, they saw an actual physical manifestation. How can we know it? And I'm going to just continue to talk about maybe kind of, um, get you to talking about it in, in this respect as well. How important is it that they knew that God was with them? That the first thing that I think about, would they have even started if they thought that God wasn't with them? How many times today do Christians fail to live the life they need to do because they're not sure if God's with them or not? I've met a lot of Christians like that. I've been like that in some, on, a, on a few occasions. Is he still there? Is he still listening? Is he still caring? You know, and that's whenever I try to spend some time myself working through um, or reminding myself of those passages where Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5, and that Jim mentioned. Also, you think about uh, Matthew 28, 20, and I will be with you to the end of the age, amen, a promise that he made to the apostles that they went into the gospel and preached the whole world, or preach the gospel to the whole world. So the importance of the presence of God, if we really believe that God was with us, could we be doing more? Could we be doing better? Could we be really, really more evangelistic than what we are right now? Or do we act like it's all us? Now, here's the reason I'm asking this question. And it's something that I'm just challenging all of you to think about. I grew up in a Pentecostal church. Um, I'm talking about um, jumping benches, looking for the miracles, the morning bench religion. Um, and I was taught by my mother that, uh, you know, and I, as I was trying to be, uh, trying my best to understand this, I was taught that, you know, well, I just feel it in my heart. Okay, now that immediately begins to bring out some things. The ideal of the heart, where is the heart? Uh, we talk about the heart being the center of the, the soul, and I understand that point, but I thought it might be at the time, at the time she was trying to explain it to me, that, that blood pump, and I never could understand that. Um, I've come to the realization now that it was, you know, part of the mind, the mindset that you have. But a lot of people want that physical manifestation of God's presence in their lives. They want him to nudge them in the right direction all the time or uh, lead them in the right way, you know. How many people have you heard preach um, from those denominational contexts that suggest the Holy Spirit uh, told me to say these words this morning. Okay? And, I, and I'm, just, I'm just sharing with you my heart a little bit. This is something I've really struggled with all of my life as a Christian. I remember right after I became a Christian, the, the day I was baptized, man, I was walking on air. I knew that I was saved. I, I said, you know, ready, Lord, I'm ready to go. Let's go right now. But then life came back in and troubles came back in and I got mad. I grew up on a farm 
farm boys have this tendency when they get mad to break things, but also sometimes to um, say things they should not say. I, I was there, okay? And so whenever I started letting this stuff fly I and mean, something didn't happen right, then I thought, well, I've sinned, so God's not with me anymore. And I lived my life for a while struggling. Some days, whenever I was feeling bad emotionally or I was sick, then I thought God left me. Because again, I was taught that it's something that you, that God's presence is something that you feel. Now, here's what happens. I think sometimes in the Lord's church, we haven't addressed this to the point to where we can really understand it because we react the opposite way to the Pentecostals. And we go to the point that says, no, the only way we can know is because the Bible tells us so. Well, that's enough. Amen. Is that enough? If he tells us that we're there, you know, if he'd be with us to the end of the, that's enough. And it goes back to what Jim was saying earlier. He touched on it just a, bit, a little bit by talking about the idea. This is what faith is. Faith is believing that he is with us. Well, again, the question pops up, how can I know that besides just the Bible tells me so? Is there going to be something else? And I think we've reacted so far against the Pentecostal idea that there are some in the church today saying what? Well, you can't know anything, right? You can't know whether he's with you or not for a fact, so you just have to trust God's word and have enough faith to trust God's word that he's going to be with you. I make this hey, Tommy. because I think this, this presence is a very important thing when we start talking about how does Christ live in us? And which is something that is a great deal of discussion in the Lord's church, how does the Holy Spirit dwell in us? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Do you see that that ideal of the presence of God in the life of the Christian? I think a lot of that is going to be determined on our teaching and our beliefs. I think we have gone, like I said, from one extreme to the other in the Lord's church. For many, many years, we, we would have show no emotions whatsoever. Now you go to the opposite extreme to where we're showing emotions over every little thing. And I don't think that that's what God wants us to do. Well, I, I felt the glory of God in my heart this morning. Well, how did you know that? I mean, was it just something you felt? Did you, did, was it something that you, uh, are you basing this upon an emotion? And then I was also, as I've been struggling with this in my own life and trying to understand this, <clears throat> I've read books on the Holy Spirit. I have read books on uh, how you can know these things. And uh, <clears throat> I've never really found a definitive answer other than the fact that what? The Bible tells us so. Now that ought to be enough, okay? So uh, I'm asking you to maybe chime in a little bit on this today. <clears throat> how... If, if God was with the children of Israel and he showed himself he was by the, the cloud and the pillar of fire, what is the significance for us today? How, do I, how can I know today that he's part of us? All right? <clears throat> and I'm going to throw it open to everybody and, and see where we go with this. Well, one of the things that I thought about was look at Jesus' example. You know, Jesus... <clears throat> he gained his confidence by uh, what he learned. You know, he had to, to learn. Right. And uh, when he learned, you know, the more and more that he learned, the more he grew, um, the more confidence that he uh, had, you know, with the father. And that was kind of his checks and balances, you know, um, with what he learned. And it's kind of the same, I feel, with us as Christians today. You know, uh, Christ, he, he was emotional sometimes, because, and righteously so, you know, when uh, they were making a mockery of his father's house. So therefore, we, we have been given these emotions, uh, not to go overboard, but to, to feel and to have empathy and, and uh, sympathy and all of that. Uh, but at the same time, Christ never sinned. So, you know, it's kind of one of them things to where with the Pentecostals, 
I think that a, a lot of them get caught up in um, parroting, you know, because they've heard the same thing growing up. And see, I, I dabbled with them um, off and on for a couple years as well. So a lot of that is seeing is believing, feeling is believing for them. Mm -hmm. um, but that is not the walk that Christ has shown us. Um, by his very example, he showed us that seeing and, and feeling is not the way. Um, because every time he would be uh, about faced with something, he would go uh, pray to the Father. You know, so um, to kind of answer all of that, I just, I feel like our example is Christ. You know, as far as like um, the, the, the Israelites having God, you know, to kind of lead the way. And, they, and like, like the brother said, they still didn't um, fully obey because as soon as they got out of uh, Pharaoh's way, they were back complaining and, and what, what have you. And they saw the miracles. They experienced the miracles. So that is, that's never a surefire way to know that God is with you, you know, because um, God had to punish them. Um, but for us as Christians, the surefire way for us to know is to be educated like Christ was educated. Okay. And I like that. You mentioned the idea of Christ's obedience, and I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, though he were son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. So he had to learn something. And that's always been a very, that's always been a very interesting passage to me. He had to learn something. He was God in the flesh, but he had to learn obedience. <clears throat> and he had to learn it by suffering. So we a lot of times don't, um, we don't like the way we have to learn some things. We really don't. All right, anybody else got some more that you want to add to that? I appreciate that. I want to add to Brother uh, Tim, Brother Jim, and Sister Tib uh, Tibbell. They lived by action, really by faith. Uh, Thomas was in doubt, but what Christ said, blessed he that believe and have not seen. Yeah. We, we know Christ is present by the action and things he does for us every day. <coughs> it's our faith that we know that he's present by how he takes us every day of our life. Right. Okay. And, and, and I agree with that 100%. Again, it's by obedience. He learned obedience. So what you're saying here is the same thing she was saying. It's obedience yes. to the word. It's obedience to the word. All right. <clears throat> Have any of you ever gone to worship without really, quote, feeling it, end of quote? Yep. <laughs> Everybody do this. <laughs> okay. Have you ever gone uh, with the idea of, uh, uh -huh. of you doing it because you know that's what you're supposed to do, but you walked out feeling, and again, I keep emphasizing this idea of feeling. Again, remember the, what I'm trying to say. But you walk out wondering if you were, if God was even there. Um, Brother Tommy. Okay. Uh, for me, there are a number of things. Um, one of the criticisms that Jesus, uh, one of the criticisms that Jesus made of the of the Pharisees is that they did not have any heart in their religion. Yeah. Uh, Jesus talks about um, they have drawn to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And I think one of the things, me, education sh should bring about our emotions, all right? Our being, being taught, our being trained in the word should bring about some emotion in us because Jesus Christ, God, the Almighty God doesn't want us to serve him, um, you know, being sad and, and all of that. Now, one of the things that I find fascinating is the fact that while our emotions uh, isn't the sure foundation because it, it can change and God doesn't really act on our changing moods and whatever. But I think if we get to the point where we feel that we must be so literal and so studied in the word that we forget the fact that we need to serve it, then we have a problem. And, and I think that sometimes we're on Thomas. Um, Thomas was not condemned for anything. He wanted evidence. And I, and I think our faith should stand 
and everything. And that evidence oh. must be so sure that we're going to, to serve God out of joy, out of contentment. Okay. So again, what I'm hearing, and I appreciate this because this is exactly what I'm, what I'm hearing, is our faith, which motivates our obedience, should be the assurance that he is with us, right? And that we cannot put, and I like what you said earlier, we cannot put, um, <clears throat> we can't put a lot of stock in the emotions because uh, the emotions a lot of times are based upon knowledge. And sometimes we may mm. think, and again, again, a lot of, think about how a lot of this stuff gets started whenever we're very young. Our parents are trying to teach us something. Uh, our parents uh, made us feel guilty whenever we didn't do something right. If we, a lot of times that guilt trigger can cause us to do greater things than other things, right? Yeah. But can that at the same time, uh, could that be a way that God is using that? Yes, but can it be something that becomes overpowering to the point to where it destroys us? Absolutely. So you see, I think all of these things come into play here. Um, but as I said, I grew up in this particular background, and I just wanted to share with you a little bit of my, my thoughts about that idea. I also see the same idea when we start talking about how, when you start thinking about the idea of how does God dwell in us? Does he dwell in us as individual Christians? And there's a big discussion in the Lord's church today about that, right? How does the spirit dwell in us? How does God dwell in us? And it's always been interesting to me as I've listened through across the, the <clears throat> board on this discussion about the spirit and the, <clears throat> um, how God and Jesus and all dwells in us, you know, Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but what? Christ lives in me. You know? So I guess we, the Pentecostals are going to the point, if, if he's living in me, then I have to feel that emotion somehow or another. We've got some other on the other extreme that says, okay, I don't feel that. It's not an emotion as much as it's what? I know that's what the Bible says, and it's all faith. Is there a middle ground there somewhere? And I think that's the point that uh, Brother Eddie was trying to make earlier. Uh, we can go to worship service a lot of times and not feel the emotion, uh, but still be encouraged. At the same time, are we so afraid of becoming Pentecostal that we deny the power of emotions in the church? You see, well, we, we, we go from We got to stop. Um separating the emotion for who we are. We're emotional people. We're human beings. Right. And we're spiritual. Right. So, um, happy singing songs. You know, happy, you know, hugging. Be happy. And sometimes you might be sad, but it doesn't mean that God departed you. That's your human nature. We go through that. Um, if somebody um, stands up, like I said, in, in the middle of worship and say hallelujah, everybody turn around and look at them. That can be an emotional response, not a spiritual. But is it wrong? Right. Somebody might say, oh, can I say something you're like? not being controlled by Somebody said you're not being controlled by the spirit or you're not con controlling yourself because you just made an outburst in worship, now you're disturbing everybody. Now, I'm not saying to do that every time um, the preachers say amen and stuff, but, but suppose it happens. It's, it's a distraction. It's a <clears throat> okay. Arisley says a disruption. I'm not saying it's not a disruption. What I'm saying is, suppose it happens. Are we to look down on that person because they had an emotional output, outburst? Because the songs are spiritual and they responded, they might stand up, thank you, Lord. And what do we do? Oh, you can't do that. Now, I'm not saying to disrupt the service by constantly doing that. Suppose it happened one time, we're going to crucify the person. Yeah. And that's something to think about as well. Uh, <clears throat> uh, um. Or Terry, were you going to say something? I'm sorry. 
Yeah. So, uh, and I'm just trying to say it in a, <laughs> in a way, because sometimes I just blurt stuff out. So y'all please forgive me. But um, I could hear, I could hear the lady, the sister. Uh, I, I kind of feel what the sister is saying, because see, you have to look at the apostle who was saying, you know, hey, I bring my members into subjection. I, you know, I'm in control. I control myself, you know, especially when it comes down to worshiping the father, because see, we're not here for ourselves. Now, yes, we do. Um, Cause me, I, I have a high zeal. Uh, I, I'm energized, you know, when I'm in the presence of my brethren, because I, you know, I love them so much and I miss them and stuff like that. So, but at the same time, um, I keep things decent and in order as God would have us to do because I mean I you, you can understand that those people that we're talking about in Exodus you know they were very very emotional we could even see how they were saying hey don't let don't let God talk to us no more because they were afraid and all, all kinds of stuff when they when they were in his presence um you know we are coming in his presence but we're doing so in a spiritual uh way so yes we're gonna have emotions and things of that nature but that doesn't mean that we should not we shouldn't control ourselves now those who, who are on different levels, because you have different levels of our spirituality with God. You have, you know, the babes in Christ, and you have ones that are maybe teenagers, and then ones that are spiritually mature. Um, if I were to see that in our church, because we have seen that before, we're not going to crucify them, but we just understand that, you know, they're probably growing, and once they, you know, come to a better knowledge, they'll be in better subjection to, you know, their their feelings and things. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just say something? Yes, go ahead. Um, okay. Um, well, I, I see I see your point. Uh, since there, there for me is a, a subtle suggestion that to be emotional is to be spiritually naive. So that when you grow up as a Christian, then you ought to be controlling yourself. I think that... In, 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 the, in the Lord's body, we have gone to extremes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think of passages like, enter into his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. All right? And I'm saying, we have become so, and, and one person said that um, we're emotional beings. We are so afraid of expressing our emotions that we have, come into to worship um i'm not about being uncontrolled that's different but it's as if we, we 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 find it difficult i've been in congregations where truth is being said and you say amen and people look back at you and say well why are you saying amen <laughs> as, as as if that's not you're not controlling yourself uh, one of the things that that um that that i consider as well whenever we are taking the communion we take the communion and act as if Jesus Christ is still in the grave. We, we, we sing, we're mournful, we are, we're, we're sad, and, and, and nobody ever think, well, I mean, for me, I, I'm yet to see uh, somebody saying, okay, thank God that Jesus Christ is resurrected. So, so I'm saying we have gone, and uh, we must be careful of the extremes. We can't be disruptive. But that I say amen or hallelujah or praise the Lord doesn't mean that I'm not in control of myself. Because uh, Corinthians talks about how can those who are not learned, the unlearned, say amen, suggesting that if you understand what is being said, then there is a response that is expected. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, you know, I just think that we need to be careful in the church that we don't go to too far extremes. And I'm with you there 100%. And like I said, I've seen it. You're right. Well, You're I'll right about that. that uh, you know, I've seen it go both ways. I also ways. think that um, sometimes we can be conditioned. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, don't do that. And we're so conditioned for so many years, nobody wants to step out of bounds. Not that it's out of bounds. But nobody wants to rock the boat. I'm sitting there in my spirit and my emotions, and I can't express both of them. And that's I'm not, what I'm I'm not I'm just not saying being out of order and disrupt the service every yeah. every five minutes. You jump the house. No. But <laughs> an outburst here and there, here and there. You mean it's gonna disturb the preacher? He can't keep preaching over that. 
But I tell you what, you came from oh, from on. the um from what you call it, the Pentecostal. <laughs> I come from different there too. <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I miss some of that. See, I don't know who to pray the Lord. I miss some of that. Okay. That's why I was finna go. I was finna go there because see you. <laughs> You know, you see that a lot in the Pentecostal, but you know, uh, like I was talking to this one lady, I was like, a lot of the time when they're doing that, they only do that in the worship. Have you noticed that? They don't do that. Like, <laughs> now we get happy about a lot of things in life, you know what I'm saying? But they only do that and they get uncontrollable when, when we're, you know, so-called worshiping. But my point was like, who does that serve? When we give in to, and, and, and like the brother said, now you're right, you can't, you can't go to the extreme now, but, uh, but who does that serve when we allow, you know, that to disrupt? Because see, some people, they need to be able to focus on what, you know, the preacher is preaching on or whatever, and then we, we jumping up and, <laughs> and this, that, 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 and then they can't focus and they, they all discombobulated. So it's not always about us, but we're here you know, to, to give him uh, the glory and everything. So it's all about him. It ain't about us. It's happy. It's, it's happiness to us. Yeah. But you know what I mean? If that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah, I want to say something on that. You know, but it, it's so funny that they can do it. They can have the outburst and they can hallelujah and this and that and, and the preacher just keep right on preaching. Don't miss a heartbeat. It bothers us, and we the church. Oh. Now I'm not saying I'm, like a, that's way up. I'm not getting up <laughs> doing it, but I'm just saying we 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 confine ourselves, but they do it. You have hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, and the preacher don't lose a beat. Come to church, of Christ. Christ you're out of order. You're out of order. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. See, he glorified, you know, he, some of them, they live for the accolades. You know what I'm saying? Like some of those preachers, especially if you go look at these televangelists, they, they live for those accolades. And so it becomes really about what he's saying. We can't glorify our brother regardless, you know what I'm saying? Because he's a servant like we are. So we can give, you know, that, that type of honor to him because it goes to God. So sometimes when they're hollering back and <laughs> and rooting rooting him along and this that 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 you know it's serving them and him but not God you know what I'm saying? I, I hear what you're saying, but I can't say that that's all the time because we can't stereotype either. Yeah, because one person over here jump up, yeah, he might be giving the preacher the accolades, but the other person over here might be giving it to God. So we can't put everybody in the same group. Well. Yeah. And that's the thing, I think, uh, and I didn't mean for this discussion to get to this point, but again, <laughs> what I was trying to get us to do was to think about the idea of the glory of God. And it's interesting, there are two examples in Scripture where you have people coming into the presence of God, and what was their response? We remember Isaiah chapter 6, whenever he was brought into the throne room of God. And again, they emphasize the idea the Lord was sitting on high and lofty throne and him of his robe filled the garment. Seraphim stood above him. They had six wings, two covered their face, two covered their feet, and two they fled or flew, sorry. And they, they called to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Um, his whole glory, his glory fills the whole earth. And the foundation shook at the sound of their voices and the temple was filled with smoke. And what was Isaiah's response? Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the king, Yahweh of armies, the Lord of hosts, again, is the way that brought out. In John, or in Revelation, John is brought to the throne room of God, Revelation 4 and 5. And again, it's interesting in that context that we see him praising God the Father in chapter four, chapter five, who gets all the, the praise there is the lamb. And of course the lamb has representative of who? Jesus Christ. So again, and again, what was John's response? He fell down and worshiped and he fell down and realized that he was unworthy to be in that presence. 
And I guess that's the point I'm trying to make as I was trying to bring all of this out. Um, in the fact that sometimes, and I think uh, the sister a moment ago brought this idea out, sometimes it becomes about us. I want to show everybody how religious and loving I am. And so I'm going to, you know, speak out in church to the point to where uh, it's going to distract people. Um, and again, preachers going back to what Jerome was saying that have been in that context all that time, they're still able to go on and preach and do what they need to do. Um, and then on the opposite extreme is, like I said, we in the church where um, sometimes the only person it seems like you ever hear that, is, is that, the, thong, the thong leader. And, uh, you know, and and I've been in churches before where somebody stood up and said, amen, half the congregation would die of a heart attack because somebody said, amen. You know what I'm trying to say there? And I'm not trying to be ugly and I'm not trying to be, I'm just telling you the honest truth. And, and it's an yeah. interesting idea uh, as well in, in that matter. Uh, I've had the privilege to be able to speak to African American communities as well as, you know, as a white preacher. And, and I've enjoyed, uh, you know, being with my brethren there in that respect. There's, I guess I'm trying to get kind of full back around to where I was a few moments ago was where I was trying to get us to say is we a lot of times see this stuff as proof of God's presence. Whereas it's not so much a proof of God's presence as much as it's how we have been raised and reared in our different backgrounds in our different cultures about the way it ought to be. I, after doing a great deal of study about, again, the Holy Spirit, remember the idea I was trying to get to the point, First Corinthians, or First Corinthians chapter 3, he emphasizes the idea that, he said, verse 16, do you not know that you are the temple of God? And who's he talking to there? In that context, he's talking to the whole church. You are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone devours the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And so he then says this, he said, I want you to know that, and I think what Paul's doing in these situations is reminding them that the spirit is dwelling in us. The, we remember Colossians 2.20, as I said earlier, Christ is dwelling in us. We know that God dwells in us. And we've got to remember that I think in a lot of the times when he was discussing this, he was trying to emphasize to the brethren about the kind of lives they needed to be living and make sure that they weren't engaging in sin. God's presence should remind us constantly that he is there and should remind us constantly that I cannot be guilty of engaging in sin. In the context of 1 Corinthians 3, as I read it, I think he's talking about the church. He gets even more specific in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, when he was talking about brethren in the church guilty of going to harlots. And he says, no. And he said, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? I think in the context of 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking about the individual Christian. In the context of 1 Corinthians 3, he's talking about the church as a whole. And in both situations, he's calling us to greater living and to always remember that God is there. And I think that's part of what God is doing here in Exodus. He's reminding them of his presence. I'm in the middle of a camp. I see everything. I know everything. I understand everything that you're doing. And before this all plays out, we're going to see as he brings them into the land of Canaan, he will punish the entire children of Israel after the destruction of the city of Jericho because of one man's sin. One man who thought, well, nobody's going to notice this. God is not watching. And I guess what I'm trying to lead to too is to bring us up to the point if we all truly understood God's presence in our lives, as the Bible is very clear as it's there, then how will that make a difference in the way we live our lives? How will that make a difference in the way we worship? How will that make a difference in the way I treat others in the church whom Jesus died for as well? You see, the significance of God's presence, I think, 
should be causing all of us to think about others besides myself, to think about what we need to say to encourage and build one another up in the body and would also be one of the greatest deterrents to sin in our lives if we remembered every day he is dwelling in us. Now, we get into the discussion, is he doing it literally or representatively through the word, or is he doing it literally? I believe that, again, he's doing it representatively through the word as the word dwells in us. Remember, Jesus is called the word, John 1, 1. As the word dwells in us, then we, uh, the more we know the word, the more we're going to be living these Christian lives and doing what God wants us to do, and God's presence is going to be there. And the more going back to what the brother said a few moments ago, the more that knowledge we have, the more the emotions will catch up. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess for lack of a better term. And just think about that. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> like you said, one thing that keeps coming up in our conversation is knowledge. Right. The word. Right. Bible tells us walk in the spirit not to fulfill the lust of the flesh. <clears throat> so go to John, um, John 6, verse 63. It says, the, um, talks about um, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So that word that we understand and learn that word dwells in us, then we know God is dwelling in us. We have that word in us, and the word directs us. So we're right. made spiritual by that word, by being obedient to that word. Also, as a reminder, knowledge again of God is omnipresence. He also says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what he says. Now, when we sin, he hasn't forsaken us. It's just that we feel unworthy because we're sinful. We sin. So that's that conviction taking place. Now, what we need to do is repent and get back in the right standard. That comes, you know, with maturity and knowledge. And everybody's on different levels. You know, as a new baby in Christ, if you sin, you might think the world's coming to an end. As we get older, we understand, okay, all I need to do is repent of this, and I'm right back with God again, back in good standing. So what keeps popping up is, is that knowledge, is that knowledge. And with the knowledge, as we grow in the knowledge, that's where the wisdom of God will start dwelling in us. Right. And that conviction. Amen. That's right. And I think that's what it boils down to. And then think about it in this respect, it, going back to the ideal of the knowledge again, that knowledge of the word helps us to understand that he's coming again. And that, that, you know, think about this idea. His presence is a present reality today, but it's also the idea of something that we're going to have that we don't even have a clue about right now, about what it's going to be like to be in that actual um, great crowd of people that are going to be worshiping God forever and ever and ever. Um, and, and I think a lot about that too, you know, jokingly, but, but also honestly, um, some, some brethren have said that uh, worship to God is what we're going to be doing forevermore in heaven. And so uh, some folks are kind of uncomfortable with that because they don't like to worship that much. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say in that respect? They have, oh, okay, well, <coughs> <coughs> I don't know if I want to be singing before God forever and ever and ever. The thing is, is what again, you know, one day all of this faith will become sight. The hope will become reality. And the reality is, is that we can then see him in all his glory. That's what he is. Revelation closes up with the idea that Jesus, we shall see him face to face, you know, so what a powerful book and what a powerful suggestion that is. And I think this idea of, of God's presence and the glory of God, it needs to be something that maybe we need to meditate on, teach a lot more in the Lord's church and emphasize uh, not to where we become stoic in the pew to where we we're afraid of doing anything that's going to offend God. Uh, but we should, you know, we ought to be afraid of offending God. Amen. 
but at the same time, we're not carrying it to the opposite extreme of to where it's all about me, look at me here, and, and the way I'll get you to look at me is by shouting and hollering and hooping and all that other stuff. You know what I'm saying? That's going to be the opposite extreme. We've got to get back and stay with what God says and always, again, remember the idea that God is with us. God is, God is present with us. And so what it a challenge that well. is for every one of us. But I tell you well, yeah. I, uh, it was kind of strange to me. I was in a Bible study one day. Now, I understand hearing this in the worship, but I was in a Bible study and people were saying, Jesus, Jesus, praise the Lord. I was like, huh? In the Bible study? So mm -hmm. I'm guilty for what I'm talking about. And we were in the Bible study and people were like saying, Jesus, hallelujah. That was kind of strange to me in the Bible study. Uh, but it's the same thing I'm talking about, you know. Right. right. Somebody might look at somebody stranger in a worship, and I did the same thing in the Bible study when I looked upon them and like, what are y'all doing? Praise the Lord, Jesus. It's a Bible study. We're not even in worship. Mm -hmm. But who's I to say that that Bible study wasn't hitting their emotions. It probably was. And I know I've been times whenever, you know, I'm in a Bible study, even my own office by myself, and, and you get those emotional things at that moment in time, whenever, wow, okay, all right, how did I miss this after 15 years of studying through the Bible? Oh, okay, I need to get this, I need to get this straightened out, you know? So, yeah, that's the way God <laughs> like is. And the thing is, is the more we study, the more we learn, the more we find out we don't know, so that makes us dig deeper. And, and I, this is the only thing I've seen is God's word is able to do that. It's able to make you want to dig deeper so that you can know more and more and more. Let me also suggest this ideal as we're coming to this ideal of the glory of God. We know that God's glory was with the children of Israel. They knew it. We looked through some of those passages in Exodus as he talked about God's glory there. But you think about God's glory coming down on the tabernacle at that time, the children of Israel all falling down, understanding what's happening. God is in their midst. And for a, for a period of about literally, right, if you're going after this class, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you're going to be about another year before you actually start traveling again, or maybe about nine months before you start traveling again to go back up to the land of Canaan. But think about how God's presence was with them all the time, but it was tied with the tabernacle, right? God's presence was tied to the tabernacle. And so we come to 1 Samuel chapter 4, and the Philistines, the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant in the battle with the children of Israel. And for four solid months, the Ark of the Covenant is with the Philistines. And you remember that whole story there in that respect. So what began to happen was, is that, and I think this is what was happening, especially in first, the context of 1 Samuel chapter 4, was the idea that the children of Israel thought that box, that ark, represents God's presence. So if we fight or we take the ark with us into the midst of battle, then our God will be with us and he will fight for us. And you remember what the Philistines said whenever they heard the children of Israel and they saw the ark actually in their camp. Now, nowhere do we read where God said you take the, with the exception of the city of Jericho in Joshua 7, nowhere do you really, really see where the ark is going to be led in, into battle. But they did, and it was captured. And they felt that the presence of God was with them, but also at the same time, interestingly enough, uh, what was happening to the Philistines at the same time? They were yeah, feeling God's presence. He was punishing them, right? And they put the ark in front of the Greek or the the god Dagon, and Dagon fell before the ark. Remember that? They stood him back up. The next day, he fell, and the head broke off, and the hands broke off, and then tumors and all this other stuff started happening to the Philistines. They said, we got to get rid of this thing. 
So then it becomes a situation where David, um, after that whole thing where it was brought back and David finally builds the city of Jerusalem for the purpose of building the temple, that's what his plan was. First Samuel chapter seven, I want to build a temple for God. And God makes that great promise of first Samuel or no, Second Samuel chapter seven, where he promises, "I'm going to make of you a king, you know, and you're going to you're going to have someone on your throne forever." And then you <clears throat> see how he rejoiced when he brought the ark into the city of Jerusalem. But again, remember how Uzzah died just because he touched the ark. Remember that that whole thing and how that played out. And and David then was became very afraid of moving that thing again and. Read Chronicles example or the book of First or Second Chronicles where he starts talking about that. He said, "We did not seek the Lord after the right. Well, we did not move the ark in the way we should have done it." And perhaps the thing that I'm reminded of here: you have these situations where the ark was tied with this, and you have God's presence and God leaving as it was. Then you have the ark actually brought into the temple after Solomon builds the temple in First Kings chapter 8. And the, the people are just rejoicing because it's there. But God is telling them constantly, I can leave this temple. Yeah. The book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 10, portrays God, Ezekiel sees God leaving the temple. And before that, we find that the people were saying, well, God's not going to allow anything to happen to us because as long as his temple is here, then he's going to protect us. And then God became what? The ideal of God's presence was not for the purpose of purifying people or trying to encourage people to be better. The ideal of God's presence and the ark especially became what? an amulet that's going to protect us from everything that goes bad in our lives, but we can still live the life that we want to live all the time. And I challenge us to think about the idea that there are some Christians today who will come to church and, and, you know, when they're amongst a group of church people, they are the best Christians in the world. But when they get back out in the world, then they're not. And the bottom line is now that Jesus and, and God and the Spirit and Christ all are living in us, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of Christ. God dwells in us. Think about, and I think this is where I, I was trying to get this whole lesson to get to finally. Think about how that should impact our lives every day, not just when we're gathered with God's people, but how the presence of God should always remind us of two or three things. Number one, he's here in me, so I don't want to go out there and do something that I should not do. You know, sometimes I've met some brethren in the church that have the attitude, well, uh, if the preacher don't know about it, the elders don't know nothing about it, it's going to be okay. I'm going to have the best of both worlds. I can live a life that I want to live, and nobody's going to stop me. And God's presence leaves them in a sense. And they may go through the motions of worship, but are they worshiping? Not really. Not really. Not if their hearts are not right in the sight of God. That's the reason why I like, I know of some congregations I haven't seen it, but I, I've heard a lot about it where people will start up, start a service off. Say, anybody here got some things you need to take care of? Anybody have some sins you need to pray for or pray about? Let's get that taken care of first so we can really worship God. You know, what a, what a way to go at that, you know? Uh, so you're going to be in there in the presence of God. So you make sure you get your life right first before you start to worship God. Um, Think about the idea if we thought that and we believe that God's presence was with us, would that affect the way we treat everybody? You know, my heart is saddened over the this last week about the young man down in Brunswick, Georgia, that was killed. And and I'm, I'm just, uh, it, it just breaks my heart because of the fact that there was no, no sense in it. But you think about the idea 
of um, um, I was getting this to the point. I, was, I just kind of lost my train of thought there for just a second. Please forgive me. But, you know, we are to be the Christians. We are to be the light of the world everywhere we come into. And if we, God is living in us, then we need to be that light to everybody we come into contact with. We need to be that love. We need to show that love to everybody we come into contact with. We need to constantly be setting the example that people need to see, especially in the world today, of Christians really living the Christian life. And again, if, if we really thought and, and really thought through every day, you know, the Lord is with me today. Um, Lord, as I walk, I know that you're in my presence and I'm in your presence. Father, I don't want to do anything that's going to, I don't want to do anything that's going to cause anybody to sit down and say, if that's a Christian, I don't want no part of it. I'm just challenging us to think about the idea that that's what he's trying to get across to the children of Israel. What? We are God's tabernacle. The tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. Revelation 21, verse 3. And isn't it interesting that as he chose the children of Israel in the book of Exodus, what does he say about them? They're my people. So God is going to be with his people. I hope and pray that we'll be the people that we need to be and that we don't mistake emotionalism for God's presence, that we don't mistake sitting on a bump on a log as God's presence. You know what I'm trying to say? Does everybody understand what I'm trying to say there? But that we would understand that God is with us, not just when we gather together to worship, but, but every day. God wanted to be with his people in Exodus. God wants to be with his people today. And that should be the thing that motivates us to see the lost, to see the hungry and feed them, to be compassionate and loving, regardless of skin color, regardless of socioeconomic backgrounds, that will help us to be what God wants us to be, that holy temple in the Lord, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 through 22. So that's kind of where I wanted to go with this. Um, anybody else have any more thoughts? That's beautiful. Tommy, I've got one more. All right. You were talking about the presence of God and how important it is. It got me to thinking, and I went back and looked it up. And Judges chapter 16 and verse 20, after Samson had had his hair cut, you know, he was asleep on Delilah's lap, and he woke up. And the end of verse 20 says, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. You know, the, you know, the fact that he had broken the Nazarite vow, and so God had left him, and he was, he was about to struggle in ways that he never had had to struggle before. And it was a great life lesson for him. He would learn later on, you know, the, the, you know how dependable, you know, how, how trusting in God he must be, which is a great lesson for us. But it just reminded me when you think about people who say, I, it doesn't matter if I have God in my life or, you know, I could take God or leave him, you know, whatever the case may be. I think Samson's a great life lesson for us when we look at the fact that what happened to him when, when you know, he cut his, he, he let his hair get cut and, and God left him. We, we, we know how that turned out. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Any other comments, thoughts? Um, you know what, brother, I was listening to Glenn Colley not too long ago, and it kind of goes back to a question you had asked earlier, you know, about like uh, the spirit and stuff like that. And I thought about um, what he was saying, you know, because he was like, some um, people, when they become Christians, they think that as soon as they do something bad, God departs from them, departs from them immediately, and you know they start to lose their hope, etc. But he was saying basically that um, it, what would what it would take is for you to completely depart, you know, from the way. Um, 
because his blood continuously cleanses us and it allows us that grace and mercy to try to get it right. So we can't live our lives so afraid and unconfident, you know, that we have him. Right. That's right. And that's where a lot of Christians have been, you know, well, I've sinned and I've, I just don't think I could ever get it right. And um, we, we humans have this tendency to go from one extreme to the other sometimes, don't we? We can't stay in the middle. We've got to go from one extreme to the other. And that's a, that's a real struggle that we, we've got to deal with. Anybody else? Yes, we got to realize, um, being Christians, that our God is not a, a, a part-time God. He's a God of all times. And so we as Christians, like you say, uh, as, as so many of y'all have been saying, we got to keep that, keep that in mind and keep that focus that so many people, the only God or the only spiritual or religious type situation they will ever know is by watching us. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we must, must, must display that at all times. And it, yes, the way it gets hard and it gets difficult and we sometimes lose our tempers and, uh, you know, but there's always a split second that you have to stop and compose yourself, you know? Right. And again, like I say, God is not a part-time God. He's an all-time God. He's our God 24 seven. And we as Christians have to get that buried deep within <clears throat> ourselves that we are 24 seven Christians. We are not just Christians when we meet, uh, as y'all was saying, and gather together, assemble together. We're, we're, we're that when we're not even there. Or when we go on about our work days or our daily lives or we're out in the, in the community or in our neighborhoods and such, we got to remember to put on the armor, the full armor, because if, if you go, you can't go outside <laughs> partially dressed, you'll be arrested. <laughs> so you should not leave your house or get up without putting on your full armor because you're going to need it to fight, particularly now. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> I think there'd probably be no better way in the world to end the class by but the whole idea that he go, enters the book of Exodus in the fact that what? Wow. God was with them. God is with yes, you. He was. God yeah. is with you. He's with each and every one of you. And I want to remind you of that. And so let's live up to that. Let's do all that we can to be what we need to be in that respect. And, um, I want to tell you that you have made it a joy to teach this book. As I said, I've taught it three times and every time I teach it, I add a little more and I add more to it. And uh, I know that Jerome and Rosalind have taken this class twice. And I was sitting there thinking the whole time about them trying to make this even more interesting for them. And I hope that I've done that. <laughs> but the, the channel it was do what? Yeah, it was. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the challenge that I want to give you. Each time you study it, you know, it, it's different points come yeah. out each time. And that's just the beauty of studying the, the Bible. You can take mm -hmm. class three or four times, and each time yeah. there are mm -hmm. different points mm -hmm. that are so going out. If there's out. anything, I'm going to send out on the test, and I'll get it out to you this week, I promise. And so. plus, I was paying more attention this time. Ah, <laughs> yeah, because you kind of took a this time. You, you see how much difference that makes. You know, all that students can kind of sit back there and go to sleep whenever all this is happening. And uh, all, if you're taking this for credit and you got to take, you got to write papers and all. Oh, oh, okay. You got stuff in here. You got to to what he's got to say. Oh, it's a, it's a difference um, from just doing an audit. And yep. what I've learned before is, like I said, what I've learned about doing credit is that. As you do those assignments, it reiterates what you learn and you mm -hmm. retain it. When I was um, mm -hmm. took it for an audit, I'm just sitting there, you know, just listening, you know, came doing no assignments, you know. But it's the difference when you credit and you got to do those papers and stuff like that and go over the material. Mm -hmm. Retain more. So I'm not going to be a perpetual student anymore, a perpetual audit student. Okay, I'm glad you clarified that because I'm still a student. <laughs> I'm still a student, and and I'm going to continue to be a student. And so I just encourage you to avail yourself of every opportunity that you can. And Tommy, I speaking test, of, I'm also going to send out a um, 
instructor evaluation form, be honest. If there's some ways I could have been better, if there's some ways I could have done something different to where you maybe could have learned a little bit more, let me know that. Um, because the only way I'm going to get better is if I have honest um, uh, feedback to help me to see what I'm doing wrong and how I can be better. So please feel free to do that. Uh, there will be no class next week. I'll be sending the test out. And um, um, you go ahead and take the test and get it back to me as quick as you can. And uh, that's going to count as next week's class. Okay. So I'm giving you that two and a half hours that we do here on Thursday night to take that test. I will send the test to everybody. So if any of you want to just go ahead, if even if you're an audit student and you want to retain some of this, go ahead and take it again. Take that test. Okay. Because that'll help you to remember it. I do it. And, uh, I honestly enjoy it. Do what? Oh, I said I take it. I honestly enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah, it, right. was, it was awesome. And it in really the was. next, probably in the next couple of weeks, we will be trying to. I'm trying to work it out to where I have the whole school schedule for next year done. Not oh, only wow. the, Not only the spring, but the fall of next year as well. So I'm trying to work all of that out. Uh, okay. If if I don't if I see that I can't get it all worked out, that I will get that other one up. Probably this is May. I'm uh, my my goal is by the June the fifteenth to try to have it up. Okay, for the okay. next semester. All righty. Okay. So okay. help me put my feet to the fire and remind my what I've got to do in that respect as well. If there's any of the classes that in the catalog that you want to take. Uh, we've got it. Uh, we're, we're about to post it online. Interestingly enough, I was getting all this together, and in our new catalog that we have just uh, done, um, I was part of the steering committee. We redid the whole catalog, and interestingly enough, and I, that kind of surprised me a little bit, we left out a study of the book of First and Second Thessalonians, so we got to put that back in the catalog. <laughs> I don't know how that did happened. We? We, we just totally left out. Studies. How did we do that, Tommy? I don't remember missing. I don't realize we, we missed that. I'm, I'm serious, brother. Look in the, Go back and look at it. It's not in there. <laughs> I believe you. I just don't realize how we – I don't know how we missed it when we were doing it. So. I don't either. Okay. I, just, I was starting to go through there, and I said, well, let me see what the, the instructions are. And I looked at the thing three times, and I could not find it. <laughs> it's not in there. So, anyway, what more can we say? So anyway, just Tommy, frame. Tommy, I got one last question. You want, okay, go ahead. I got one last question. You was mentioning being a student. How's your, have you finished your online class you've been taking for Exodus this semester? And if it is, how, how did it go? It went very well. It was a graduate level course. Uh, I did not actually take the test and everything because I had already taken the test on a graduate level. Uh, but right. it allowed me to look at things we all need fresh eyes every once in a while. Sometimes we all get in a rut the way we study, the way we look mm -hmm. for things. Uh, and the bottom line is it opened my eyes uh, to the point to where, okay, I didn't see that before. I didn't see, and that's when I was taking this course, I was teaching this course at the same time. That's the reason why I've added some more things to it and looked at things a little bit differently. So I think it was one of the best things I ever did. In fact, and uh, you can do this, uh, Heritage Christian University is offering some summer classes. If you want to do it, online, free, audit. Now, if you take it for credit, you're going to have to be chunking down some change because they are, they are a university, and obviously they need their money to pay their professors. But there are some... Um, um, classes that they're offering audit uh, during this summer. Uh, one of them is church leadership. Dr. Kirk Brothers is going to be teaching that. So that might be something for some of you gentlemen and all of us to look at, okay? And you can take that class free of charge. Uh, just contact Heritage Christian University. Tell them you're interested in and see where it goes from there, okay? So I just challenge you to keep on studying and keep on studying. Don't ever quit. Because when you quit, that's whenever you, uh, brother Tommy, you're not going to grow. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, I'm just just saying that for me, that's been a, a 
joy. I, I mean, very educational and edifying. There's some things that I, having done, looked at Exodus some before, I mean, there's something that I've now see, seen that I didn't see before. I just want to thank you for the way you conduct the class. I thought it went very well, and I learned a lot. Thank you, and I appreciate it, because like I said, I always feel like I need to be doing better, and uh, you challenge me to be better, and I appreciate it. I really do. Thank you. So I'll get all that stuff out there to you as quick as I can. I definitely will get that test to you the next week, and I'll get that other stuff as quick as I can and try to let everybody know whenever we get the registration up, and uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing you again um, the first week in August. That's when we'll start off. Okay. okay. So be looking for it. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And before we close, let's, let's pray. Um, Brother Rex, would you lead us in our closing prayer, brother? Lord, thank you for letting us have this great class with Tommy for the last period of time been a great learning experience for all of us and again we thank you we pray for the people with the virus we hope it improves and hope we're all able to get back to a somewhat normal life again bless all of you in the class have a great summer in jesus name we pray amen Amen. 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 Good right. night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> now, I'll be looking forward to seeing you next week, next uh, in August, okay? Appreciate all of you. Okay, all we right. Look, but we'll miss all of you all. I think yeah, good, good. I think I'm going to teach the Leviticus Numbers and Deuteronomy class. So if you're interested just to continue up from here, I'll be ready, okay? All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Bye -bye. All right. Have a great summer.